Great, thank you. So thank you very much to the organizers for organizing this and for inviting me. Um, so I only asked for a half an hour because I was assuming that some of the ring LWE background would already be given. Um, and given the uh, late starting time of this talk, I'll try to go as quickly as possible through the, <laughs> through the background. Um, so this is a bit of an abbreviated title. I did have actually a title and an abstract that I sent maybe a little bit late, but it didn't appear on the, on the uh, website. But it's um, supposed to be uh, a tax on the decision version of RLWE. Um, so this is joint work with Yara Elias and Aiken Osman and Kate Stang, which will appear at Crypto 2015. So the first thing I want to tell you all, in case you're, so it sounds like a pretty bold title, right? Attacks on our LWE. So you probably, most of you probably know, at least in recent years, what I've been largely working on is practical applications of homomorphic encryption. So, for example, my talk at Eurocrypt was all about practical applications of homomorphic encryption. So one takeaway that I can tell you right to begin with is the attacks I'm going to tell you today do not threaten homomorphic encryption schemes based on cyclotomic fields where you take two power cyclotomics. So as far as we know, unless these attacks are extended in some way, the attacks I'm talking about today do not uh, undercut our current implementations and applications of practical homomorphic encryption, which is good news from my point of view. Um, but uh, this line of research we're diving into in order to better understand whether there are additional attacks that could threaten it. So practical homomorphic encryption schemes, which we've heard, heard about several times over the last few days, uh, based on uh, work proposed by Gentry and then Brackersky and Vaikatanathan and Brackersky, Gentry, Vaikatanathan, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, a number of different um, practical homomorphic encryption schemes that are in use today for all kinds of great applications. So applications basically to cloud storage and services, including things like privacy for electronic medical records, private predictive analysis, doing kind of machine learning on encrypted data. Um, genomic computation on encrypted data, which there was a very high-profile contest this spring um, for, for this. So homomorphic encryption has been um, one of the very nice motivating um, applications for using lattice-based crypto. And we heard an extensive talk on history uh, yesterday from Daniele, so I don't have to go too much into this. This was just kind of an abbreviated version. The itai Dork public key crypto system from around um, almost 20 years ago. The Entru family of crypto systems proposed by Hofstein, Pfeiffer, and Silverman. Um, the actually, these were actually standardized in around 2008. Um, the the uh, um, kind of new hardness assumptions, take new with a grain of salt here. I mean, new meaning over the last uh, five to ten years, uh, new compared to RSA, for example. Uh, so new hardness assumptions um, that make some of these lattice uh, crypto systems possible, uh, the learning with errors and the ring learning with errors, um, Learning with errors originally pro proposed by Regev and le ring learning with errors proposed by Lubashevsky, Pikert, and Regev, and related um, security reductions that have been proved to hard lattice problems, gap SVP and bounded distance decoding and such. So this has all um, been contained in kind of the introduction, introductory talks that you'd heard yesterday and, and this morning. And um, this morning we also heard more about the ring LWE um, distribution and ring LWE problem from, from Damien. So let me just quickly review this. So, so don't even look at this slide, right? This is a lot of words and a lot of terms, right? What is ring LWE? You take a secret. Um, in this case, the vector can be thought of as the coefficients of a polynomial. So just think of it as a secret polynomial. You've got, you're going to generate a bunch of random samples. What are you going to do? You're going to generate, the secret is S. You're going to generate an A, which uniformly at random. Multiply A times S, which is the analog of doing the inner product in the vector space setting. And then you're going to add some errors. So that's what the, the ring learning with errors is just the learning with errors in the ring setting, which means given a bunch of kind of inner products that have been obscured with a small error, can you find the secret? So you've given some, some number of samples in order to do this. So the ring setting, you can do it either in a ring R or in its dual. And in this talk, mostly for simplicity, we're going to focus on doing things in the ring. 
Um, so the search problem is what I just said, finding S given a bunch of samples. Um, the decision problem is just given a bunch of samples, can you decide whether they are R LWE samples or not? Um, and the hardness comes from, uh, so in the ring setting, this um, theorem of Lubyshevsky, Pikert, and Rega from 2010, um, which basically um, says that if you, ha if you consider a large enough error that there's a polyno probabilistic polynomial time quantum reduction from the um, approximate SVP pro SIVP problem in an ideal lattices to this RLWE problem. So in addition to this hardness result for um, RLWE, there's also search to decision for search RLWE, there's also search to decision reductions proved in P LPR for cyclotomic fields and extended um, in joint work with uh, Eisentrager and Halgren for to apply to all Galois fields. So this is, again, this is all, everything I've just said is, is stuff that had been said already. Um, but now I'd like to focus on p something that was discussed in detail in Damien's talk this morning. Um, so the way I like to, to think about it is, is that you have these two embeddings, what, what Damien called sigma sub C and sigma sub P. And uh, this is kind of a key point, which is that for these proofs of security, pr proofs of hardness for, uh, you know, the foundational results, you have, um, you consider the embedding of this ring where you're going to do ring LWE, you consider this, an embedding of this ring into the co um, complex numbers in a particular way. So the usual um, uh, Minkowski embedding just takes any element of a, of a number field and sends it to all of its algebraic conjugates. And this is a slight variation on this. Um, the usual Minkowski embedding uh, was defined in LPR and called the canonical embedding. So there's just a small difference there. So you take this ring, and this is um, the thing that I think roughly is what Damien called sigma sub C this morning. And the nice thing about putting this ring inside here so that you get a lattice is that then all of these hardness reductions can take place and you can talk about the hardness of the RLWE problem um, as being related to these hard lattice problems. But now there's another important consideration, which is that for practice, for actually deploying crypto systems, what we really do is we think of some polynomial basis for our ring, um, which is given by so, some irreducible polynomial f of x. So f is going to be irreducible. So this is what was called sigma sub p. So the main thing that I'd like to highlight here with this slide is you call it the, I call it the p, I, I'm sorry, I don't call it the PLWE problem. This was called the PLWE problem by Rakersky and Vaikatunathan in their um, crypto paper in 2011 and related to uh, the work of LPR 2010. Um, and this PLWE problem is basically do the same as RLWE, but do it in this ring. So what is the difference? The only difference is the generation of the error. So here, just think of the error distributions as being these kind of spherical Gaussians. And here, they're, again, like spherical Gaussians, but they're being selected coordinate-wise, where the basis, so if this ring is written as z of beta, it's generated by uh, beta, which is a root of f. This has a basis, which is just 1 beta, beta squared up to beta to the n minus 1. So the PLWE problem is kind of, and you could call it an instance of the RLWE problem. You could call it, a, it was originally called a variant of the R RLWE problem in BV11. But in any case, it's the same idea where you generate samples as follows. There's a secret and there's a uh, kind of an inner product plus an error, but the error is now generated component-wise according to this basis. And this is what we do in practice when we deploy practical homomorphic encryption schemes. So the PLWE problem is obviously important to consider then, since that's actually what we do. And so you might say, well, why don't you just generate the error here where you're supposed to and then push it over here? 
And the answer is that that's ex one answer is that that's expensive. Another answer is that yeah, maybe we should do that. And then a third answer is that if you stick to two power cyclotomic fields, it doesn't matter. You have an isometry that maps. If you look at the, the image here of R and the image here of R, and you take the change of basis matrix, you have an orthogonal scaled matrix which maps the one basis to the other, and so it simply doesn't matter. You can do it either place. And so that's why the moral of the story from my point of view is, is that the clearly safe thing to do is to just stick to two power cyclotomic fields, because there these distributions are the same, no problem. So then the question is, what happens if you don't stick to two power cyclotomic fields? So I'm going to, I'm going to leave the case of non two power cyclotomics as an intermediate question to be considered later. But just in general, think of a number ring. So, and you want to do RLWE, or for example, if you're going to use it in practice, you actually want to do PLWE. So, what we did in the paper with um, Eisentrager and Hallgren was to show that. In general, for a lot of rings, there are attacks on PLWE. So this is how the attack works. Um, so uh, basically, like the easy way to say it is that you're going to take an RLWE or PLWE sample AI, BI. So what that means is that um, BI is of this form. It's AI times your secret plus EI. And EI has been selected with small coefficients in this basis. So it's a, it's a polynomial, but with small coefficients here from in this basis. And so what, what will happen if you um, look at this product at the, uh, at the, at the um, input 1? So you have AI and BI. They're polynomials. You can evaluate BI at 1. You can evaluate, you know AI, so you can evaluate AI at 1. And you don't know the error, but if the error polynomial has very small coefficients and it's evaluated at 1, it's going to be very small. So the fact is, is, is that all of the multiplication takes place in this ring, which is R mod, if this is R, the multiplication of polynomials takes place in r mod qr. And so when you take these two polynomials, if you write coset representatives for them, so this is all happening you know, modulo this polynomial f of x. And if f of 1 is actually equal to 0 mod q, then when you do this multiplication, you will get the same thing as if you had just taken ai and evaluated at 1 and taken s and evaluated at 1. Because each of these is just you know, ai plus some multiple of f times s plus some multiple of f, but f at 1 is equal to 0 mod q, so it goes away. So if you, um, if you have this condition that you chose a q such that 1 was a root of f mod q, then you can conclude that bi at 1 will just be equal to this quantity. And what you can do is just evaluate bi at 1, subtract off ai at 1 times a guess for s. And there are q possible guesses for s. So um, this is very similar to the uh, attack that was um, mentioned this morning for bad cases of, um, of uh, like even um, ring SIS, where if you just took x minus 1 was a factor of, of the polynomial there if you didn't have it irreducible. But here, the difference is, is that one, the, the polynomial f is irreducible, but it just so happens to have 1 as a root mod q. So um, if your guess for s is correct, then you're, you will be looking at the evaluation of the error polynomial. You have a bunch of samples. So what you can do is just start with one sample, go through until you find a guess such that the error looks small. If it is small, keep that guess. and when you go on to the next sample, only check the guesses that you already kept from the previous one. And very quickly, you'll see whether you find one of the guesses that's correct or not. So um, this is the attack on the, the PLWE problem. 
And so what I wanted to kind of summarize here, this might not be the most interesting perspective for this crowd, but from a number theoretic point of view, what we've really done is to say, oh, hey, listen, here's some interesting properties of number fields. Because if you have all these properties for a number field, you're going to have um, certain conclusions for cryptography. Um, so what we did in Eisentrager and Halgren um, uh, in the paper with them in SAC last, uh, last summer was to enumerate six properties of number fields. So first property is whether um, Q splits completely and if, the, if actually if the, if the ring is actually monogenic, then you don't even need this condition because this will just be equal to one. So the second condition is whether the, the number field is Galois. Third condition is whether it's monogenic. This property is, is called monogenic. That means that this is actually equal to the ring of integers in the field, not just a subring like we were discussing this morning in Damien's talk. The fourth property is that this transformation, if you look at the transformation matrix, so now I'm going to write that matrix um, is the change of basis matrix between these two settings. So and that in the paper with Eisentrager and Halgren, we um, required that that transformation matrix be basically an orthogonal scaled matrix. Um, the fifth property is the one that we needed for the attack. And the sixth property is just Q being large you know, for applications to crypto. So unfortunately, in that paper, um, we couldn't find number fields satisfying all six of these properties at once. And we still don't have any satisfying. Those are hard, some of those are very hard conditions to satisfy. For example, just taking Galois and monogenic together, the only known families so, for example, the only um, monogenic and cyclic Galois number fields are the real subfields of the cyclotomics. That's it. There are no others. If you take monogenic and Galois, uh, is, you're very, very restricted. There's not that many. And the monogenic is maybe not entirely needed, but let me tell you why these six conditions are needed. Conditions one and two are for the, uh, the known search to decision reductions. Now, that doesn't mean that these search to decision reductions can't be extended, but at least for now, under those conditions, the search to decision is known. Um, for three and four, that's where we're able to have a reduction between the PLWE and the actual RLWE instances. And for five and six, that's what we need to have a meaningful attack. And you need to have Q large enough to be kind of interesting for crypto. I mean, you can still do it with small Q, but nobody would use it in practice. So um, we don't have um, number fields satisfying all six of these properties. So, um, and I'll just give you an, the nice example that we know and love, which is the two power cyclotomic fields. Those satisfy all five properties, except for the one that you need to attack it. So very nice, very convenient for us. Um, so um, I'm going to skip over that in the um, interest of time. So since we can't find number fields that satisfy all six of those, what can we do? So what we did in the current work with um, Elias and Osman and Stang was to, um, first of all, try to relax some of these conditions. So the most important one that we wanted to relax was this condition of um, the change of basis matrix and not requiring basically that you have an isometry between these two images, but instead saying, well, what is the change of basis matrix and what does it do to the error? And from a kind of linear algebra pro point of view, this is a very simple question. And we have a quantity that is, it was defined probably more than 100 years ago, I don't even know when it was defined, called the spectral norm. And it just is for a, a, like a change of basis matrix, it measures if you have the unit ball in the, in the one space, which is kind of what you're interested in, small error, and then you apply the change of basis matrix, the spectral norm will give you the radius of the ball that the image lies in. So that's kind of very clearly what we're interested in here. How much does the error get distorted if you move from one to the other? So the moral of the story is that if we focus on examples where you have small spectral norm, then you're very likely to be able to relate instances like samples here to legitimate samples here and, and vice versa. So um, 
The other thing that we wanted to do was to extend the attack so that you don't have to have one as a root of f mod q, but you could have other things. So for example, suppose that f has a root beta mod q, which has um, small order mod q. So what does that do for you? So beta could be very large. It doesn't have to be one or two or three or something like that. It can be a large number. But what this says is its powers hit very few elements mod q if it has small order. So if you look at the error polynomial, look at the values that it can take when it has small coefficients. Well, there's n powers of beta that are listed in there, but they're not all different. There may be only like two or three different values. So the set of values that the error polynomial can hit is small, and you can enumerate them and then test for that condition, whether you're in that set of values for the error polynomial. So um, that was kind of the extension on the um, EHL attack that we introduced in this paper. And this is um, this relaxation of that condition was enough for us to extend um, and find examples where we can actually attack our LWE. So in the um, roughly 10 minutes that remain, what I want to do is tell you kind of what we were able to find in what we present in this paper. So roughly um, the list is, let me see, I'll come back to this. So basically we're able to construct examples of weak RLWE fields, weak PLWE fields. We're also able to construct uh, weak um, two-power cyclotomic fields even, but just with a different basis, not the basis that you would normally use. Um, and we present code for the attacks, and we also present heuristics on spectral norms, which uh, allow you to kind of make a general prediction about how often number fields would be susceptible um, to this type of, would, would have basically, would have small norm here. Um, and then we also give a bunch of kind of interesting new questions in number theory that come up from considering this line of attacks. So um, let me go back through the first, maybe you might consider the most interesting um, thing is to uh, look at the construction of the family of number fields for which RLWE is easy to attack. Um, so this condition on being uh, monogenic is, is not absolutely necessary, but what it does is it allows you to move back and forth between the ring and the dual uh, ring version of the problems. So it depends kind of on how much you care about that. The second condition is um, the crucial one, f of 1, is character to 0 mod q. Third condition is this row is going to be our spectral distortion. And sigma is the, is the error. So I think I define rho somewhere, one of these slides somewhere in here. Anyway, sorry. Rho is the spectral distortion. So um, if you, for example, I didn't say this, but if you want to compute the spectral distortion, you can compute it as the, um, um, the largest uh, singular value of this matrix. So this is not hard to compute, but if n is very, if the dimension is very large, it can be computationally a little bit expensive to compute that. Um, okay, so the main theorem that applies to this construction is that if the spectral norm is um, smaller than this quantity, then we um, expect to be able to attack the RLWE decision problem with this probability in this amount of time where L is the number of samples. So you can see how it um, scales with the number of samples that you need. And the family is exactly constructed so that when you add one, you will get zero mod Q. It's very easy. <laughs> so um, you need a few conditions because this needs to be um, irreducible in order to define a number field. And um, this is going to be true whenever Q minus 1 has um, a prime factor that appears to exponent 1. We also need a few conditions. So we construct it so that, OK, so this is a little bit bad notation because um, this is just an auxiliary prime, whereas L down here is the number of samples. 
but we need to construct it so that um, it's both monogenic and irreducible, so that's what these conditions are for. And this condition is in order to make the spectral norm small enough. So if we construct it, which we did, we found examples of this kind, um, so that all these conditions are satisfied, then you can attack RLWE on these, on these fields. And I'll give you s some concrete running times at the end. So um, how do we select parameters, both for deploying homomorphic encryption schemes and also for demonstrating attacks? Well, the funny thing is, is, is that if you look in the literature over the last five years, primarily people seem to have followed the recommendations in lintner pikert so Lindner Pikert um, from RSA, I don't know, maybe 2012, something like that, um, 11, yes, gave um, a bunch of security levels, high, medium, and low, and suggested um, parameters, for example, high security like N is 320, Q is 2 to the 12, and sigma is 8. There's a difference in the literature. Some people would call this sigma equals 3, like 2 to the 3rd. So it depends on how you're defining sigma here. But so for those parameter choices, for example, the distinguishing attack is estimated to run in time 2 to the 122 with a distinguishing advantage of 2 to the minus 64. So if you look, there are at least three or four, maybe even more by now, kind of open source or at least publicly known implementations of um, the, uh, these homomorphic encryption schemes. And um, if you look at the parameters that have been selected, for example, a very, very typical parameter set is something like n is 1024 and q is like 2 to the 128, something like that. That's if you stick with two power cyclotomics. Um, so our, um, I think you can see from that that for, for a lot of homomorphic encryption applications, Q will be very, very large. And again, when Q is large, you don't care that much about this attack, right? This attack runs in time O of Q because you have to, say, you have to go through all the guesses, mod Q. This attack makes a lot more difference when you're considering much smaller parameter sizes, which are things like I mean, you, we've seen already a couple of examples in different talks of much, much, much smaller parameter sizes where Q is small. If Q is 2 to the 32, like has been suggested for a TLS, like key exchange, then the attack is perfectly reasonable. Can't you just do mode switching to get a smaller Q? Yeah, we keep talking about that. We haven't figured out, like, kind of, everybody says that reaction, but we just kind of don't know. So this is an attack on, on RLWE. Oh, go ahead. Your F is tuned to Q, right? Your F has Q in it. Um, this particular uh, family does, but in general, it's any number field such that 1 is a root or such that beta is a root mod Q. Just start from an RLWE instance and you choose yeah. a Q for which, which the attack would work uh, or something. Yeah, but so typically, like if you're going to attack a real system, there's going to be some, you know, N and Q that were chosen. And the question is, so, so how do you do, so now you want to do a modulus switching attack, so you're going to switch it to the queue where you think you can attack it. So, I just don't know. Yeah. So I'd be happy if we could make that work. But we were discussing it over lunch with Damien, and like the two power cyclotomics, the reason that the attack doesn't work is that the only Q possible is Q equals two. And we and so can you modulus switch down if you modulus switch down to Q equals two, you can attack that one too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's right. That's right. Okay, so here's some concrete attacks. So here this is a very typical size. This is these are the parameters that are suggested for key exchange, for like TLS, for example. And if you look at um, uh, samples um, generated randomly for this problem. So what we do in practice, we generate a bunch of samples using a secret. We pretend that we have forgotten the secret. We run our attack, and then we check whether we found the secret or not. And um, in this case, the attack ran in 13.5 hours. So that's pretty good for this parameter size. Um, if you look in, these are much smaller 
levels. Uh, I mean, they're probably relevant for, for applications like signatures and things, but these are typically way too small to be used for homomorphic encryption applications. Um, and these, the attack runs in like 25 seconds. Um, so the interesting thing here is that, um, like here's the number of samples that were needed, like 20 samples. Um, and the, um, the standard distribution of the error, I should have called this sigma probably. Is, is in this column. And this tau is the quantity that I defined earlier. Um, so here these attacks are working even though this tau is pretty small. So the tau, basically the smaller it is, the harder we think it will be to attack. But we're already, you know, we're still successful with taus that are relatively small. So it's interesting, because like if you bump up the error, that's just going to make your tau a little bit smaller. So this border of how small tau can be and we still succeed is, is really important. Um, but we're, we're succeeding with taus that are much smaller than where we expect to, to be able to succeed already. And all of this was run with um, Sage Mathematics software. So I think I'll just close by mentioning some of the interesting number theory problems that are introduced by this. Um, for example, like what are the spectral distortions of algebraic numbers? So I talked about spectral norm over here. If you just think of the algebraic number beta um, and call its spectral distortion the spectral distortion of this change of basis matrix, um, an interesting thing that we've noticed is there seems to be a correlation with algebraic numbers that have small Mahler measure, which is something that's studied extensively in number theory. So small spectral distortion could be related to, like, ex there's extreme examples of number fields with small Mahler measure. That looks kind of like an interesting connection. Here's this question that's been studied over time by many people, which is, can you construct fields which are Galois and monogenic, um, other than cyclotomic number fields and their real uh, subfields? Um, things like, what are the distribution of elements of small order, mod Q? And then finally, things like, so like, what is the smallest uh, residue modulo prime, which has exor uh, order exactly R, is a more specific version of this. And an interesting number theory connection here is, is that typically people think about the Artin conjecture, which is what is the smallest residue which has like the full, or, full group order, like that generates the whole group. So it's kind of a flip, it's like a reverse of the Artin art and conjecture here. So one reason that I like to mention this last slide, in addition to the obviously interesting um, cryptographic uh, aspects of this talk, is, is that I think that investigating these attacks brings up lots of interesting new questions in number theory, which will hopefully keep lots of number theorists busy for a long time, even completely independent of crypto applications. So thank you very much. Questions? So, what's so special about one? Uh, is it enough to have a small root of f for all of this to work? Uh, yeah, but if you have even two, then the error polynomial has, you know, the degree is n. So it already has two to the n in it. So one or minus one is fine. Um, but um, then even once it's two, then it's going to be very, very hard to distinguish. So, um, so, so if I understand right, the, the, the pick your favorite one of ver version of the distinguishing attack. The, so you have a case where this M matrix is pretty close to an isometry. I mean, it's not too crazily distorted or anything like that. And, uh, and you have a distinguishing attack. Um, so, so geometrically, things look like they like they should. I mean, like if you were to yes. view everything in the canonical embedding, it would look pretty much supposed to, you can distinguish um, any thoughts on, uh, on search, or, or how, what, what do you think is happening there? Well, so, oh, I guess the one thing I didn't mention I meant to was on my list was is that um, we know that we have the search to decision reduction when you have the Galois thing, which is essentially what was explained this morning by Damien with the automorphisms. When you have the automorphisms, then you can move things around. Um, but we, we don't know um, search to decision reduction, you know, for a larger class of fields yet. But we, do, we did some kind of heuristics on, like, how often we thought that the, um, the spectral norm would be small. 
And heuristically, it looks like a large percentage of fields would fall susceptible to this. And so then if you believe that, like, say, Galois fields are randomly distributed among fields, then you would think there would be some fields in the intersection that you would have some where you would have both the search to decision reduction and the attack on the RLWE problem. So, I mean, we certainly have the cases of the PLWE attack plus the search to decision. That we know. But we just don't have the relationship, like the, even the two power cyclotomics that have a different basis. So, um, yeah, so you, you can attack them and they're Galois, you have a search to decision reduction, but it, they, you can't relate it to the usual RLWE because the, dist, the, the error gets sent all over the place. So. When you look at the change of basis matrix, are you looking at the condition number? So large it's close. It, no, it's, it's related to the condition number, but spectral distortion is not exactly the same. So is, is small spectral distortion necessary for this attack to work for RLWE? Well, so I think of it very naively. You're given a bunch of RLWE samples, and then if you want to use the attack, you push them over here into PLWE samples. If the error doesn't get distorted too much, then the attack will still succeed. If the spectral distortion is large, it seems to me very likely that at least one of the coefficients will get, you know, will be quite large. So is one of the coefficients being large enough to kill the attack? Mm, you know, we don't know. We just know for sure that if it does stay small, then we will succeed. Is there a, is there a, like a interpretation of what's happening up, up above instead of pushing it down into the PLW? Is there an interpretation of what's happening in terms of how the, how the ideals factor or something? Well, okay, so I'm, if you mean, okay, so Q, what we're assuming here is that F does uh, split mod Q, right, or at least it has a factor here, which is saying that either Q is, you know, split in this ring or, for example, one of the, we think we might be able to extend the search to decision reduction to cases where it doesn't split completely, but it splits into other ideals of um, the same degree where you, the Gawa group acts transitively anyway or something like that. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if that's what you meant, but for this for this attack, we're assuming that we do have at least a root mod Q, which means, for example, Q is not inert in this ring. Mm 